Robin Makesons is a freelance contemporary flutist based in Chicago who recently recorded one of my solo alto flute pieces as part of her 52 Weeks of Flute project, where she works with a bunch of different living composers. I recently had the opportunity to sit down and talk with her over Skype, over her projects, her career, and new music in general. So my name is Robin Mixons. I am a freelance contemporary flutist based in Chicago. I specialize in working with living composers in like long-term direct collaborations. I've been running 52 Weeks of Flute, which is my current uh, collaboration project for the past eight months. And last year I did 365 Days of Flute, which was my initial foray into YouTube collaboration and YouTube creation, and now I'm looking forward into more extensive collaboration projects with other people and more composers. So what gave you the inspiration to run the 52 Weeks of Flute or 365, all these different collaborative flute projects? Like, did you just wake up one day and you were like, oh, I should... I, I need to work with like a bunch of living composers or like... so essentially essentially what happened was I graduated with my master's in 2016 and moved to Chicago and started a freelance career and was kind of floating around not really doing anything and not really getting any work or anything like that because I was brand new to the city and it's hard to start a freelance career in a new city and I was thinking about what I had done on the internet previously, because I did have a relatively big Tumblr following and had already built some stuff on YouTube, and was thinking about uh, Olivia Jaeger Jaeger's 15 Second Harp, and also there's a drag queen named Fifi O'Hara who had done 365 Days of Drag, where she, uh, she did incredible makeup every day for a year. And I was thinking about that and how it could translate into music. I play flute. There's a ton of flute rep. And so it originally started actually as just standard repertoire. And mixing with Olivia's project, I was thinking about, I have all these composers and I'm so big on working with living composers. How am I doing this project with just standard repertoire? And so that's what started my first call for scores and did 138 pieces by living composers through that project. And at the end of it, the one thing I wish I had been able to do was work with the composers more. Because there were some pieces that were great and didn't really need a lot of input and they were really fun to play. And there were some that I could feel were right on the edge of being really, really excellent pieces if someone had given them feedback. And I gave them as minimal feedback as I was able to, uh, but through email and through me learning it for four hours, there's really very little you can do. And so... I started thinking about that, and that's where 52 weeks came from. I was thinking, okay, a week is a good amount of time to work on a piece, especially having learned a piece a day for a year. I have a lot of technical facility. I can do this. And that way I can Skype with the composers. We can like email back and forth. I can send them recordings, and we can actually have more of like a festival-style process but without any of the travel or the fees or any of the like limitations that festivals kind of create. And it worked out pretty well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I would say so. Uh, you mentioned you had a career trajectory that kind of went to Chicago. And I know that at least as someone like looking at grad schools now, a lot of it is about location. And you're not just like looking to, in my case, like work with, a composition professor that you really gel with, but you're also looking at what opportunities are available within a big city. So, I mean, that's from what I'm, what I know, the composition world. Uh, is there an analog in the flute world of, you know, does location, I mean, I imagine location matters quite a bit, but how much does it matter or does it matter more or less than you were expecting or what's it like? I think... I, so I did my master's at Indiana, which is a very small town. Bloomington, Indiana is not a big place. And really the only music that's happening there is the school. So you have this very small, very insular community where you get a lot of opportunities. But when you graduate, you kind of have to move on. 
Um, and I was looking at places that had a lot of new music happening that were the big metropolitan areas that were not where I grew up. And so I kind of narrowed it down to really the big three, which are New York, Chicago, and LA. Didn't want to move to California, didn't want to afford to live in New York, and Chicago was closest. I grew up in the Midwest. It seemed like a safe risk in terms of me moving somewhere that I didn't have any connections. And as I mentioned before, it was really not an easy process because there are three huge music schools in Chicago or Evanston. And there are people there who have gone to school there, who've done them, their masters there, who've established themselves within the community and are going to get hired over someone who no one knows. And that's totally fair. So it's a matter, if you don't go to school in the place you're moving, it's a matter of how do I find my position in this place? How do I network properly? How do I get these people to hire me over someone they knew for four years? And that was where the YouTube project came in because it was something that I could do with no one else's help. And it also felt like a way to get my name out there, not just in the Chicago community, but also in the international and like worldwide community. And also it was a ch like a chance to work on things while also meeting people here and building connections here. And in the past few months, it's slowly been working towards actually having a, both an online and an in-person career where I'm getting hired for things and I have uh, spaces that are willing to give me like performance venues and things like that. So it's definitely given me the time to figure out what was happening in Chicago while I was also still playing. Yeah. You, you I mean, you're a freelance flutist, is what, you know, you describe mm -hmm. yourself as that. So do you, I would imagine that you don't have much in the way of a, like a normal day or a normal <laughs> schedule. I mean, am, am I correct in, in assuming that? Well, I actually do. I work full time as a pharmacy tech. Um, so I do have, I have a very consistent schedule there. Um, and that has allowed me time to create a consistent schedule of practice. And I mean, the 52 weeks process kind of has to go one way or else it's not going to happen. So I do have a schedule in that I kind of know exactly what I need to do every day. I don't work Fridays or Saturdays. So then my day's a little bit different then, but in terms of during the week, I really, I practice in the mornings or I talk to composers or do this kind of thing. And, or both, and yeah. then I go to work, and I come home, and I edit videos, and I do all of that stuff, and repeat it, and that's kind of how I've lived my life. And it's one of the things that I'm adjusting in future projects, is that it really doesn't allow time for anything else. But right now, that's my reality. <laughs> yeah, well, and no, it's good to have uh, some consistency there, because otherwise, you know... Yeah. It, it, it's hard to be effective and efficient in using your time if it's like, what am I going to do this week? Oh, yeah, you know, I don't, you know, that's, it's good right. to have that. And that was one of, that was one of the big things that I discovered pre-365 is that if I don't have some structure to work within, I don't really do much. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so the, like the school structure was always easy because it's music school. You always have something to work towards. But getting out of music school was like, okay, how do I make this happen? And I probably did it to an extreme, but <laughs> it's worked quite well. Yeah, it, it's better to be overly scheduled than, than not scheduled at all. Yeah. Uh, moving on to, you do a, like, a lot of new music stuff. That's, I originally <laughs> found you through your video on uh, Cassandra's Dream Song. Uh, so could you tell us a little bit about just how you got into the wonderfully weird and wacky world that is new music and uh and then we'll move on to like new complexity in mm -hmm. particular because i'm very intrigued by people who see those scores and like think oh i want to play this <laughs> um so i was really lucky i grew up in cleveland ohio and cleveland is home to at least when i was in it the only youth orchestra that focuses on contemporary music i think there's one other now but either way, it was definitely the country's first, and it is the oldest, obviously. Um, and it was, I, I kind of call it baby's first new music now, because it wasn't anything super out there. It was very approachable. Michael Daugherty, like, um, 
we did, but they commissioned a piece a year, uh, at least. There was a commi- there was a commissioned concerto every single year, and usually at least one other piece. And it was kind of an idea that music doesn't have to just be written a hundred years ago to be valid. Um, and it bringing me into my undergrad where I went to University of Toronto, which is a big new music school, and it's kind of the Canadian culture of new music is very different than in the States, where it's really something that you do, it's part of your lessons, it's part of everything that you do, and so working with the student composers is kind of just expected. And I went a step beyond and joined Contemporary Ensemble and did all of that and like got my first experience playing Crumb and some of these more intense uh, <laughs> composers. Like Voice of and, the Whale, and I mean, imagine, I think yeah. of like flute, new flute music, and that's one of the things I think about. Right, exactly. I actually didn't play Voice of the Whale until quite recently, but um, we did the Madrigals. The We did book two of the Madrigals. And it was also just a chance to kind of play chamber music that hadn't been played before, <laughs> yeah. or at least had only been played a few times. And going to Indiana... I discovered that there are 50 composers who are very, very happy to have someone play their music. Yeah. And studying with uh, Kate Lucas, who was a contemporary performer, she actually premiered uh, Cassandra in, in London. She wasn't the premiere, like, she didn't premiere it, but she did play the London premiere of it. She, I was someone who had done what I wanted to do, knew what, was, what it was going to take, and was also able to teach me some of these skills and teach me some of this music that is so, so hard to approach when you don't know what you're doing. And I knew the contemporary sounds, I knew how to make all of these sounds, I just didn't know where to start. And so I had a teacher who was able to help me get there. And so once I graduated, I felt comfortable taking on pieces that I had never seen before because I knew I had the skill set to be able to do it. It it just always fascinates me, like, some some performers are like really they're okay with just like playing the standard rep and like playing the orchestral excerpts but you know new music is such a big world like it's not just it's not just weird stuff or mm-hmm. like you know quote unquote weird stuff there's like it, yeah. it's, there's such a wide variety of stuff that's being written now that I'm I'm amazed that there aren't more folks like you who like want to play new things cuz like that's if, if you don't do that, it feels like you're kind of unnecessarily limiting yourself. Well, one of the things that I see, especially with, like, music schools and the way they teach contemporary music in school, is that they focus on people like Fernie Howe and the George Crumbs of the world, which are amazing and, like, they're totally worth studying. But they don't really talk about some of the spectral stuff and some of the more tonal writing and people like Lieberman and some of the m- more traditional composers that are still writing new music. Um, and there are so many different genres within new music, which is why n- like there's so many different little like subcultures and things like that. And you also have so many people writing music that are composer, like they're contemporary composers because they are writing music right now, but it isn't in this like very intimidating, very alienating world. Um, we kind of focus on the alienation parts of what contemporary music is right now, and we don't really look at the stuff that, quite honestly, is quite beautiful and quite approachable. And honestly, some of these things, some of the even alienating things, when you just hear them, don't sound as alienating as when you see them on the page. Um, one of the things I really like trying to do is putting some of that stuff into a context where you don't see it, you just hear it. Um, and so you can kind of hear that there's difficulty level and there's something going on, but it's not, look at this scary score, I'm going to play it now. It's like, here's this piece, here's its context, here's what it's about, and now I'm going to play it for you. Yeah. That's what I like about flute music in particular. I just think that the sound of the flute is easier to get away with like mm-hmm. strange stuff because there's there's so many extended techniques involved yeah. and it doesn't i mean extended techniques like if you're looking at a Fernie house string quartet like you there are moments where you think is this really a string quartet or is this like a, a collection of insects that he's torturing <laughs> uh, but it, 
so how did you like you it was that just part of your world and then you you decided that you were going to spend time working on cassandra or how did you come to know about funny how so amusingly enough the semester the summer before i started grad school i was at orford summer music festival which is uh one of the big music festivals in quebec and i was there with the contemporary workshop and i was working with all of their composers and a friend of mine uh who's a flutist was talking to me and he's like oh do you think you'll ever learn cassandra and I was like, no, no way in hell. <laughs> and then I started working at Indiana and I kind of, I was thinking about how I wanted to end my master's and how I wanted to play my, I had two recitals. I had done one that had the Franck Sonata and a C.P. Bach uh, Sonata and then a couple contemporary pieces. And I was thinking about how I wanted to end my degree there and end my schooling because I wasn't going to go back and was thinking about what was the biggest challenge I could set myself with in contemporary music that I felt like I needed a teacher to help me with. And Cassandra, of course, came up because it's kind of this like big capstone piece. Fernie Howe is this big looming thing in most people's repertoire where it's like, if you can learn this, it's a big deal. And Cassandra is quite honestly the easiest of all of the like big solo pieces he wrote, but it's still definitely a challenge. And so I built this program basically building into Fernie Howe and building out of Fernie Howe. Because it wasn't the end, it wasn't the end of the recital, it was actually the second to last piece. And the last piece was a premiere of a flute and clarinet duo that used all the same sounds as Cassandra but in a much lighter, much more jovial texture to kind of show what that piece could be in a different context. Fernie Howe remix. <laughs> yeah, but also with clarinet and a few other things. Yeah. Um, but it was basically just a challenge I set for myself for my final year of my master's of I'm going to learn this piece. I've like I think I can do it. I know all these sounds and it was something that was so daunting to me. And even a year previously, I had said I was never going to learn. So it was kind of just, uh, hey, I'm going to see if I can do this. And I'm going to do this because I put it on a recital program, so I have to play it. Yeah. You lock yourself in and then... Right. Yeah. Um, and it was also aided by the fact that my teacher had learned it. So it was someone... I was studying with someone who could actually give me real life advice and not just theoretical advice. Yeah, so you mentioned like, like this is that was your capstone for your master's. So you're you're pursuing a, a career and you're like you're, you're done with school at this point. I I think so. I quite honestly, I don't want to go back to school if I'm not studying with someone who focuses on contemporary music. And most of the people who are like that, like Molly Barth is someone who I would love to study with, but she teaches at schools that don't really have a contemporary degree available. And they're not necessarily surrounded by other musicians who are as focused. So while, yes, you can go there and study with them and really tailor your degree in terms of meeting other musicians and working on chamber music and things like that, you're still going to have the same problems as you would in a more traditional degree. And I don't want to do doctorate. So the two programs that exist for contemporary doctorates aren't really appealing to me because I don't want to spend three years. I want to do like a diploma, if anything. So yeah. I'm not saying that I'm not going to go back to school. I'm saying that until the degree program that I want exists, I'm not going to. <laughs> yeah, that's that's really important to to know like what's out there. You're not just going through school for the sake of going through school. Like, yeah. But coming from like looking at you know what m the rest of my career in school is, it's like, well, if I want to have a fighting chance, I gotta I gotta go all the way through and like get a doctorate and then you know. And in, in composition, that's honestly, at that point, it's kind of just expected that you have a doctorate, which is interesting um, that it's different per performer versus composer. Um, but I guess it's also seen as a more academic field. And at this point in the academic fields, you really do need a doctorate. And I just want to play and I don't want to do research as much. So that's where the DMA concept doesn't really appeal to me is I want to perform and I know that any doctoral program I'm going to go into is going to require research. 
Yeah, so, so you're saying like the, the flute programs that exist out there for DMAs are more along the lines of, you know, if you want to go in and you want to start teaching flute. Well, it's not even... Like, uh, Bowling Green and San Diego State are the two programs that I'm thinking of right now. Um, they have contemporary performance doctorates, which is very, very new. But they're still, having talked to people who went through them, they still have a lot of research, there's a dissertation involved, and there's coursework. So someone, I, I really want like a performer's diploma, but in contemporary music. And I mean, there is the Manhattan School of Music Contemporary Masters program, and that's something that I've like considered. But again, I don't really want to move to New York. I really do like Chicago. So until there's something that like fits everything, like if Claire Chase started giving uh, a de- like a if Claire Chase started doing a diploma program, I would be there in a second. But she doesn't. <laughs> so <laughs> I mean, you don't have to tell me who Claire Chase is because like I don't. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, so that's probably some some big name that I'm just not aware of. Cause she's the place. she's the founder of Ice, and she uh, is. Oh, also, I should probably know that name then. Actually, yeah, she, <laughs> she's probably Whoops. the most famous contemporary flutist in the world right now. She won a McCarthy Genius Grant. Um, she's doing this amazing project, which actually did in the back in in retrospect inspire some of my stuff. Where every year for 21 years, she's commissioning a full program of solo works. Um, leading up to the 100th anniversary of Density 21.5. Um, so she, and actually last year, or in 2018, she did a full marathon concert of the first five programs. She played all five back-to-back, basically. It was incredible. <laughs> My lips are just thinking about that. I never, I've never even touched a flute. <laughs> um, but yeah, she's... I mean, she's kind of every contemporary flutist idol, and it's kind of a cliche to be obsessed with her, but there's no reason that you shouldn't be, because she's absolutely incredible. And also one of the nicest people you will ever meet. <laughs> that, that's good. You know, it's, it's good to have your idols actually be, you know, nice yeah. and not total jerks. Exactly. Um, but I, I, like, I get asked about her a lot because she's kind of who I looked up to the past few years and I always kind of say I, I don't want to be her I want to be the next her I want to be she was kind of the groundbreaking contemporary flutist she kind of made it a thing that was possible and you, she's a superstar in the classical world and it's legitimate that she just plays new music so I don't need to do that that's been done but there are so many venues, especially with the internet and with everything that like the age of technology has brought to us that I think needs to be addressed and needs to be have someone make break that ground and I'm quite happy to be that person. <laughs> so academia is not like a real like I, I guess I've just wanted to open the question like what are your thoughts on the state of musical academia when it comes to like teaching new performers like or in like contemporary composition like is the way you've described it so far it doesn't sound like there's that many like the programs are new or you know it's still Mm -hmm. really calcified in the museum culture of you must play this beethoven orchestral excerpt Mm -hmm. or you will face the wrath of the la brea tar pets or whatever right (laughs) and i mean like it's any, I think any musical education should cover the whole range of the instrument. Like, I would never say that you shouldn't learn Bach or Mozart or whatever your oldest repertoire is, but there is such a focus on the older repertoire that you miss a lot of the newer repertoire. And there are pieces that are entirely standard that some of my colleagues had never heard. Like, things like Takamitsu Voice or not necessarily Density 21.5. That one's kind of been established but like voice of the whale by george crumb um even the barrio sequenza which are 50 years old are seen as this like thing that you don't go near and those pieces aren't don't even touch some of the depths of the flute that stuff that's being written now or even like 20 years after has come to there's no vocal techniques. There's very few extended techniques in the barrio. There's like a few multiphonics and some key clicks, 
but it doesn't even touch some of the more percussive sounds. And it really, we kind of put this box around contemporary music and it's like, it's a thing that you have to have a lot of knowledge to do. And that's true to an extent, but we've spent so much time learning how to do the other stuff, why are we not spending time learning how to do the, the newer stuff? It's part of being a well-rounded musician is knowing everything. Um, and that's one of the things that I really emphasize in my own my own education as well is like I'm not just going to play contemporary music. I do still like I'll pull out Mozart and I'll play other stuff and I'm very much interested in having a well-rounded career. Although if you ask me do I want to play Mozart or do I want to play Barrio, I will always pick Barrio. Um, but I think we're, we're, we're going in a direction that I'm really excited about, but I think there needs to be a change in the more traditional education as well as having more specialized programs. Um, because had I not been with the teachers I was or had the interest level that I did, I could have gone through my degrees and really played one or two of the standard contemporary repertoire. Probably would have ended up playing the sequenza or uh, like maybe Takamitsu because there are some easier pieces than voice where they don't go as intense and there's fewer extended techniques. But it's, I know a lot of people who go through their degree and maybe play one contemporary piece because they were forced to. Yeah. And I'm not saying that we should all be forced to play contemporary music because if you don't, or if you don't enjoy it, then you shouldn't play it. But you should at least know about it and know what there is and be able to do it if asked. Yeah. Also because it makes you a more well-rounded musician and gives you way more opportunities. Yeah, it's an acquired taste, but you don't know if you don't like it unless you give it a shot. Right, yeah. and as we said before, there's so many different versions of new music that, like, there's a few pieces that were in 52 weeks that had no extended techniques. They were relatively tonal, but they were written two years ago that's still completely valid new music. Yeah, it's the the world is really wide open now when it comes to all these different styles. And mm -hmm. I actually I want to get back to talking about the new complexity stuff in particular because I think it's really fascinating, not that I write anything close to that. Uh but just in looking at trends of music history it's like I've I don't like the fact that people got so into serialism because it was <laughs> like it's an interesting concept, but like people like, you know, Boulez were like very much like, if you don't write this way, you are a terrible person. Yeah. Uh, and then it and then it started fracturing, and then you have the new complexity composers like Fernie Howe coming. Who doesn't even want that label? Yeah. Well, I mean, Debussy didn't want to be called an impressionist, but you know, and, and that's, yeah, and that's who, not for the composers to decide. And that's like for... Lesis preferred to not be referred to as Lesis, but there they are. <laughs> yeah, it's you know a musicological. I, what I've learned is that every musicological term, the composers it's in reference to are like, no, I don't like that, but you know, it's it's not their, yeah. it's not their choice to make. Uh, specifically, you know, I've talked to a lot of uh, string players who have seen the string quartet scores. And they might say, yeah, it's it's crazy, it's really out there music, but it fits, like it's very idiomatic to play if you can get the rhythms down, like it, it's not mm -hmm. impossible to perform, like, because he has a very good understanding of the methods of tone production. Mm -hmm. Is there an equivalent to that on the flute? Like how well does it fit under the fingers and in the mouth and I mean, in your body it's holistically? A it's a mixed bag, and, like, some of it, it, it helps that Cassandra was his first. That was his first venture into that style and into flute writing and everything like that, so you kind of have to give him a little bit of the benefit of the doubt because he'd really never gone that far before. Um, but he did, he does claim to play flute. We're a little unsure about that one, but <laughs> it, it does sit relatively well. It's, there's nothing that's not possible out of context. It's more, can you do it in the context of everything else that's happening? And there's a few fingerings that don't work super well, and like there, there's always going to be a few issues, but in the grand scheme of things, if you know how to make the sounds, you can get the piece down. 
Um, it's something that takes some time and you have to kind of sit there and work out these like I talk about there's like there's one note that has eight different markings on it and it's a crescendo and there's like flutter and there's there's so many things happening and it comes in in from this really busy section and goes right out into this busy section and it just takes a lot of focus just on a one note kind of thing so you really do have to have the mental focus to be able to get through something like that so it's not necessarily not idiomatic for the instrument it's more do you have the mental capacity to spend that much time on something like this it sounds like a, more of a mental etude than a, a yeah. as much as a physical one because like just yeah. just the amount of density of information that's on the page right and it's it's definitely so, like it, it literally took me a year to learn like i started it in march of 2015 15 and played it for real in my recital in March of 2016. Um, and that was the first time I really played it where I felt confident that I played it. <laughs> but you knew um, what was involved going in. You knew that it would be like a really long mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. Process. Yeah, I knew. And I, I knew at that point I was less experienced learning music quickly. Now I kind of, I think I could probably take it and be comfortable with it in three or four months just because I'm so practiced at practicing music. Uh, At the time, that was really the first venture I've ever done where I was so, so focused on one thing. Uh, Now, having done 365 and 52 weeks, I have set that time limit for myself, so I have a better idea of how to learn things. Um, But it definitely, even then, four months is a long time to learn something. Yeah. And it's much more rehearsal time than modern composers generally get, but I'm, I'm not salty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've, I've had some of this, like you get a, you get a rehearsal the evening before and then the day of, and then like, yeah. you know, the orchestra's off to the races. It's like, eh. And I mean, and that's something that I, I don't love. And it's like, my projects aren't necessarily because I don't want to spend the time. It's because I want to get as much in as I can. But the, the idea that like contemporary music doesn't get as much time in rehearsal and things like that is, kind of sad because quite honestly most of the time it needs more rehearsal because it's denser or has more complicated rhythms and when you're putting an ensemble together that's something that's so much harder to do but for some reason basically because of music culture and the way that we're all educated contemporary music is like oh yeah it's that thing that you throw away and you learn at the last minute um and I, that's definitely a mindset that I had for a while. Um, but now, being a contemporary specialist, it's a little bit different. <laughs> I was talking to a composer recently who used to do, um, who used to organize new music concerts in New York in the 1980s. And he once asked a flutist uh, about a particularly complicated passage in one of these new complexity styles of pieces. And, you know, it was just a whole bunch of notes crammed together. And uh, he was actually, my, the, the composer I was talking to was actually a flutist way back in the day. So he was like, how, do you, how would you possibly play this? And the flutist said, uh, it's just a trill. <laughs> so uh, I guess part of the new complexity style is it looks harder, harder than it is. Yeah, I think it's part of the intimidation factor. Like the intimidation factor is part of the music. Um, and I mean... Cassandra's kind of been something that I've done a lot of research on and looked into a lot and made a 20 minute video on. And one of the things is that it, the discomfort level that the audience might feel is also something that the performer is meant to feel because it puts you in the right mindset of, in Cassandra's case, an argument between two people. So it's also a compositional technique to get the performer to do what you're interested in. Um, and it's also, I think some of the new complexity composers are just trying things. They want to see whether it's possible. And instead of like asking someone, they just put it on a page and see if someone can do it. Yeah. Cause I, I'm familiar with unity capsule a little bit. Like I've, <laughs> I've, I know that exists as, is that like a, is that trigger? Every time I, so Every time I open a score to Unity Capsule, I go, never mind. 
<laughs> I, I do have a question. So, you might know the answer to this. What is a Unity capsule? I have no idea. <laughs> At least Cassandra's dream song. You know, it's a dream song. Yeah. That's a, um, or a dream of Cassandra that's in a song. I yeah. I So there's two scores that I've seen of Fernie Howe specifically that like, despite knowing Fernie Howe's writing and having played Fernie Howe, I still can't wrap my brain around and Unity Capsule is one of them and Sisyphus Redux is the other. Um, and Sisyphus, Sisyphus, blah, 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 blah. Sisyphus Redux it was written in 2002 and it's for alto flute. So it just has all of these like one, Fernie Howe had very much established his style, and two, it's written for an instrument that doesn't have a lot of facility, that he's asking for a lot of facility. Um, but he... Fernie Howe is very clearly just kind of exploring what he can do within his very twisted, warped brain. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. He it's seems amazing. to know what he's doing when I've seen interviews of him. Oh, like, he totally yeah. does. He knows exactly what he's doing, and he knows exactly what he wants, and he can sing those rhythms. Like, he's one of the only composers I've ever seen who can actually tell you what those rhythms he's he's writing should sound like. So I, I can't fault him for it. But personally, I just, I need need to get further into my career before those pieces are something that I even tackle so i still have some uh roadblocks to get through and they're all for anyhow <laughs> yeah well if, if he didn't if he wasn't capable of singing those things who would be like oh he's just a hack who like he just you know keyboard mashed into sibelius and this is what resulted nope he did not <laughs> yeah because i i mean i think we're, we're all we all be forgiven if we saw that and it would just like what you know we because it's mm -hmm. hard to wrap your brain around like this is it's not just music, but it's very like specifically finely crafted. Yeah, like everything has a has a place. Whenever there's like a zillion notes and mm -hmm. a zillion. No, markings. you can you can fault for anyhow all you want for his writing style. What you can't say is that it isn't entirely clear. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just it's... slightly horrifying to watch sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it's like a mad scientist. He's yeah. he's, he's the Doctor Frankenstein of of modern day composers. Yeah. I, and I think there there are a lot of people who have done even more since him, but he somehow has this like pedestal of you if you can play Fernie Howe, you've done something real. And I, I I don't think it's legitimate, but it's also kind of I also have the feeling of like yes, I can play Cassandra, so I've done something. <laughs> yeah, well, in the it's like it's like a beating a boss in a video game almost. Yeah, but exactly. Yeah, especially in the flute world, and I feel like the string quartet world as well. Like that's if you're like a contemporary string quartet, if you can play that, like you're in the Ardidi level. Yeah. Like you're you're at the upper echelon of that. Exactly. Versus like piano music, like maybe more Michael Fennessy, who has like his big English country tune suite, mm -hmm. which is just I mean it, it it's. It's madness. It's it's the piano equivalent on it because there's so many notes. Right. Yeah. But my favorite part of that is that there's, there's this wonderful section in that piece where it's like, it's this nice pastoral. It's not really complicated rhythms, but they're longer note values, and then it just like it slowly builds up, and all of a sudden you're just like these massive, like it sounds like someone just like flopping like a dead fish on the keyboard. <laughs> so I don't pretend to understand it, but I'm also not gonna like pass judgment on it because it's like he's. They're clearly saying something, but yeah. it's like you could be speaking Hungarian. It's like I don't, I don't speak Hungarian. Yeah, that's a that's a, no, that's actually a Milton Babbitt quote. Like he's like talking about like modern music. It's like when you first time you hear a sentence in Hungarian, you don't understand Hungarian, but you can, you know, you can get into that mm -hmm. world and yeah, you know, I don't know what it is about Hungarian. That's yeah, I guess it's just like, Hungarian is a very yeah. weird language. Yeah, it's like one of those language isolates. Like it's yeah, it has or, no, it has no influence. Yeah, that's so weird. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's, let's stop the linguistics rabbit because we could go down into into that. I mean, I, <laughs> oh yeah, it's something that I've I don't know much about, but the little bit I know is 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 fascinating. Uh, so I guess we can we can end up by just I can ask you about like what your compositions are like because I know you're doing some stuff of your own mm -hmm. to finish off the. 52 weeks of flute project and what's uh what's your style what do you what do you do when you have to write for yourself so i'm obsessed with this difference tones 
Um, and I think one of the few flute techniques that really hasn't been used to its full advantage is flute and voice um, with the single player. Because, and it's, it's because difference tones are created, that's why I love it, but it's also something that is so hard to write for because you have to deal with voice type and range and everything like that, that I think really a flutist has to be the one to develop it just because we're the ones that know more about it. Um, and so I, granted, have a very low voice and have a very wide vocal range, so I'm able to do a lot of things with it, but I'm kind of exploring this somewhat spectral sound world of flute and voice and different weights of flute and voice and different ranges and how the two interact. Um, so it's almost a duet with myself a lot of the time. And within that also exploring not like not full sound, air sounds, percussive techniques, but really kind of pushing the flute past its tradition and into something that is a more diverse instrument. Um, I think we kind of put flute in a box too much, and contemporary composers don't generally do that, but there is a that kind of an idea that flute is pretty and it doesn't really have that very aggressive sound that you can create with the use of the more contemporary techniques. Yeah, that's. I think that's why we as composers, we like to use it for it because it has a lot of those extended mm -hmm. techniques, but they all sound they all sound pretty good. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. we're talking about my piece, I was you know you could murder a puppy with an alto flute, and it sounds it sounds totally you know yeah maybe not for the puppy, but it sounds it's, it will sound good because it's an alto flute, right? Yeah, or just a, a flute in general. But just kind of creating different sounds with flute that composers wouldn't necessarily think of because they're not the ones playing it all the time. Um, one of the things, Dana Jensen is this amazing contemporary bassoonist, and one of the things she talks about is kind of exploring your sound worlds. Because she does a lot of improv, and when she's teaching improv, it's find your sounds and then find what those sounds can do. And so I'm finding what my sounds can do and kind of creating a language of flute that is specific to me, but I think could also be a, like could uh, end up being applied to other players once I get an idea and a grip and kind of more an idea of what I'm doing. <laughs> well, the difference tones, I didn't even know that was possible on a flute because mm -hmm. I'd never seen someone to even try to do those. But, you know, if you come up with a way to to teach that or a way to replicate that and, and notate it, you know, that might be the next, be like uh, Mari Kimura's subharmonics. Yeah, the violin. exactly. It's, like, it's this new thing, you know. <laughs> But right, physicists, yeah. I mean, they don't know how that works. Yeah, exactly. So that's that's a, one of the mysteries of our time. I'm, I'm convinced that they're going to find, like, the theory of everything by, like, studying her sawing away at one of those sub know, right? But, yeah, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for selecting yeah, my piece. And good luck <laughs> in everything. Thank you. You too. <laughs>